This week I'm joined by David Beth, who is the co-owner of Theion Publishing and the founder of Pandemonic Current and a hero fan of its associated initiatic groups. He has received various Western esoteric transmissions and is well known for his past work as the former head of Michael Burchow's Voodon Gnostic Orders. David is also a Hoongan priest of Haitian voodoo and an initiate of Afrocentric secret societies. In this episode, we discuss vitalism, the work of Ludwig Klages, voodoo, and David's cosmic gnosis system. I'd like to say a big thank you to all my patrons for making this work possible, and if you'd like to support Hermitics or join the Hermitics community, please find our Discord, Patreon, merchandise, and donation links in the description below. Enjoy. Okay, so David Beth, thank you for joining us on Hermitics. It's a pleasure. Uh, so before we get into the Hermitics question, this episode is following on from the Ludwig Klagers episode, which was with Paul Bishop, and we're going to be dipping into Klagers with in relation to your system, Cosmic Gnosis. But I guess for anyone who doesn't know you, they're going to be thinking, "Hang on, this guy has his own system. Who is this guy?" So you have a pretty full-on and diverse. I don't know how you feel about the word occult, but occult background. Yeah. So, um, do you mind letting us know, you know, telling us about who you are and what it is you do and the, impo- the important moments? Well, oh, uh, yeah, I could, try, I could try to lay this out. Um, for someone who doesn't know me at all, um, it's probably a, a complex story. Um, I, was, uh, I was born and raised in Africa um by german parents uh, however um i was uh, very early on introduced to a very diverse cultural and religious setting my parents uh, were both kind of atheists um, my father raised catholic my mother protestant however they were very interested in like philosophical questions you know my father was big on schopenhauer and kant and you know nietzsche whatever was in vogue in the 70s and 60s and so forth and uh, at the same time he was very interested in african um tribal um religious uh, thought and religious uh, experience so um he was actually spending a lot of time researching these things and writing on those uh, while we lived in angola and um so um, apart from my parents' interests in uh, these types of, uh, you know, diverse religious um, expressions and topics and a very vast library dealing with uh, philosophy and, um, you know, all these uh, metaphysical topics which were, uh, of course, uh, of interest in those days, um, uh, uh, they were at my disposal. So I was... Um, uh, uh, you know, researching those things, reading those things, and having a very, very um, broad uh, intellectual background from very early on, because TV wasn't really um, a thing we would do uh, in Africa, where there wasn't really a lot of channels to to watch. So uh, that was that was uh, an advantage I've had in regards to an intellectual um, background here. So this kind of interest in metaphysical things um, kind of like stayed with me through Africa, through my life in Africa, which um, allowed me to see a lot of things. People live with spirits and um, all types of numinous forces on a daily basis, regardless of whether they are university professors or whether they are um, village people, simple village people. Uh, It doesn't matter in Africa, um, ancestors, spirits, all types of numinous forces. Basically, the living cosmos is constantly present in people's lives and impacts uh, in a very, very um, profound and immediate way. Uh, And this is something that has always struck me as a a very uh, important and uh, interesting thing that Europeans, especially when I lived back in Germany then, um, never really seemed to connect to at all. Uh, of course, then in living in Germany um, was completely different. A very rational, um, a very non um, non metaphysical approach to life. Uh, you know, um, Germany nobody's religious, as you probably know. We have a very low uh, amount of people actually uh, believe in God. Um, so you know, people uh, go about things in a very different uh, way, um, approach life in a very rational type of way. So um, I've, however, also had this. Imp- brought into my life as well. My father and my mother always raised me as very, um, you know, rational and uh, questioning things at the same time while being open to religious questions. My parents uh, approach religious questions more from the um, kind of like, let's say, academic um, side or interest side, right? Um, And um, so they always, uh, you know, taught me to be very um, inquisitive with things. So, however, I always thought, you know, there may be more to life uh, than uh, there uh, seems, 
So um, I try to, you know, as a teenager, I start to dabble in occult type of things, you know, trying to think, well, you know, I really don't believe in all of this, but if I try out these kind of rituals, let's see if something happens, you know, better for me, then, you know, I can continue with something there. If not, I tried it out, you know, for fun reasons. And so I kind of started to work in these kind of uh, areas. And um, I did actually have uh, interesting results. I actually felt that I was connecting to a strata or a dimension of life, which uh, to the rational person is uh, not accessible. It wasn't like demons popping up in front of my face and, you know, coming out of the smoke, poof, uh, you know. Um, but it was more like... Um, a type of a type of layer of experience would suddenly open up to me, which previously wasn't available to me, and it would actually then um, impact on me in various different ways and help me to I don't know live my life in a deeper way than previously. So this um, you know uh, uh, propelled me also in my academic studies to research Gnosticism, ancient Gnosticism, and uh, all types of different spiritual systems of antiquity. So I. I I crossed over between history and uh, history of religions and kind of in investigated all these kinds of things. And I became interested, especially in Gnostic thought. Um, you know, especially intriguing was for me the idea that uh, there is a reality that we live in, but it's not the real reality. It's a kind of fake reality that is being um, basically put upon us by powers which uh, keep the other reality hidden from us. Um, and uh, keep us in, enslaved or in bondage, in a sense, right? So, you know, um, create laws for us to live by, which are, however, not in harmony with our true nature, which we have lost uh, or have uh, lost uh, the, the touch with and so on. So this kind of uh, thought was very intriguing for me because it would kind of connect to my experiences I made that suddenly there was a strata uh, of experience available, which previously wasn't really. So... Um, I became actually active in um, so-called neo-Gnostic circles, um, circles which uh, worked within kind of a churchy sacramentalist structures, had an apostolic succession, and uh, which provided um, kind of a, um, you know, ancient Gnostic teachings in more modern closing um, and uh, initiations which to go with it, you know, initiating you, sacra giving you the, the power of the sacraments uh, in which to connect to a deeper levels of consciousness, which then they relate back to Christ and original teachings of Christ and so forth. Anyways, giving you the opportunity through initiation to reconnect and rebuild your um, true sacred nature, which, however, is not the nature or the self that we usually move about with in our everyday experience, which would be the well, flawed experience, so to say. So and this was my first big step into the world of um, organized spirituality, working with different techniques and different ritual uh, techniques and uh, ways in order to activate certain powers inside of yourself to manifest um, the true you, so to say, or the true I, in, 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 a, in a sense. Um, and this then led me also to um, come to more occult circles. You know, Alistair Crowley, you, I think you, you spoke to Richard Kaczynski some time ago, right? Uh, on Alistair Crowley, I guess. And um, so it led me also in these, in these kind of environments and, uh, you know, practicing and learning all types of uh, esoteric systems and topics. Um, so I became quite known for work with occult technologies and, uh, and so forth. And at the same time, I always uh, kept one foot in African uh, traditions. So um, uh, I was uh, still very strongly related and interested in voodoo and um, West African expressions of uh, spirituality, whether that was voodoo or, or Nigerian more related but different um, type of, of, of African spirituality, um, which then led me in more recent times to become a, a, a voodoo priest in Haiti. So I was initiated in Haiti as a, as a traditional voodoo priest. So, so basically um, what I'm interested in and how, what I developed later on in the last 20 years was basically a type of Gnosticism, however, that's reversed from the original Gnostics. The original Gnostic thought would basically be that the material phenomenal world in which we live is um, a flawed type of place that the original um, transcendental uh, realms, pleroma, the origin, um, 
created various transcendental worlds with, uh, which were in harmony with its original transcendental source or parent. Um, however, at one point something happened and um, some kind of degeneration state has started to take place, a devolution in, um, you could call, spiritual emissions and development, So, um, which led, to make a long story short, which led then to the creation of the phenomenal world um, by a false god and a, um, a flawed being, uh, which then um, basically injected its um, flawed personality into this creation uh, of the material and phenomenal worlds. Um, and the human being, however, is in this world. Uh, however, it has like a little spark uh, which comes from the pleromic source. So it is as little possible of salvation in a sense. If he develops this kind of spark, he suddenly finds out he doesn't belong in this world, that his true reality is, of course, uh, to be a part of the original transcendental sphere which gave birth to everything, which essentially, as you as you can already see, it's a it's a it's a theory of emission. Uh, a, a transcendental source basically pours itself out to always more dense, dense, dense layers of existence. Some of them very flawed. And uh, however, if we do the right spiritual work, we can find ourselves back to that original um, sphere and kind of like um, re-identify with. Um, uh, what is true and what is uh, what is what is essential essential being, which, however, has nothing anymore to do with the phenomenal or the material world. So um, my Gnostic philosophy or my Gnostic work um, has basically turned this uh, around. Like uh, Klages uh, would also probably be accused of having done. So um, I actually believe that uh, the phenomenal world is the true reality. It is actually um, uh, uh, the world of the phenomena that was there um, before anything else. That has um, a natural. That is the natural um, archaic uh, strata of uh, experience and life, and that there was a transcendental uh, type of intrusion or something within the course or the development of life allowed something flawed to manifest itself. Um, which then kind of disturbed a type of natural harmony, um, which is um, the flow, the rhythmic flow of life uh, uh, to which we have been naturally um, associated with. This type of natural realization, this natural way of being, this natural experience was broken by this transcendental force, which Klages identifies as the spirit. Um, which then kind of lodged itself onto us and broke this harmonious relationship between microcosmos and uh, macrocosm and um, basically um, sucked us out of that harmonious, unconscious um, relationship we had with life itself and suddenly created a, a very uh, a problematic um, subject-object relationship with the world. So, so, so instead of unconsciously moving in the world, we suddenly um, treat the world as an object. We suddenly become external to what was, to what is really going on. And um, suddenly, since we suddenly stand out of a natural um, rhythm, uh, we suddenly feel that this natural rhythm is kind of alien to us. And we have to kind of project this uh, sense of identity, this sense, this sense of alienation, uh, into a type of transcendental sphere, which then gave rise, in my opinion, to all types of transcendental models um, that explain the world and the origin of the phenomenal world and, and why we're suddenly caught in it and why we can't really relate to it. So the sense of alienation, um, however, um, which the Gnostics also identified, but however, they identified it because you know they believed the phenomenal world was ensnaring them is exactly the opposite to me. I find that the... Uh, uh, the rational consciousness, if you so want, uh, or the, uh, the the force, the power which creates rational consciousness within us, actually um, is creating the disharmony which removes us from our um, primordial experience of what life really is like. So I have developed uh, various um, mechanisms and technologies uh, with which to kind of like uh, return to this more primordial experience. How do we reconnect to life? How do we, how can we reconnect to nature in a more profound sense? So to, to, to make it more simple, like uh, what do we need to do in order to um, not be afraid anymore of death um, to end our existence? 
um, how is it how is it possible to uh, align with uh, the world in a meaningful way without constantly um, being afraid of uh, something to well negatively impact on us on a daily basis? What takes us out of this um, manic search and planning for a future goal? Um, we would probably talk about this: the will to power. Is the will to power a problem? You know, how is setting goals for the future and basically uh, projecting all of our wishes and um, ideas of who we want to be into a future, um, in a future, into a future moment, and trying to pursue this? And once we are there, we 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 suddenly are not really happy, and we have to kind of set new goals uh, which to reach. Um, so it's kind of like, you know, um, we put her, we put our own carrot in front of our nose, like the donkey and just kind of like always trot after it. And actually we allow it to, we actually allow ourselves to actually possibly reach it. But once we reach it, we find that the carrot is, is not really nice and we want another carrot. So, um, how do we escape, um, this manic, um, pursuit of something which we constantly, um, identify, however, with our life on earth? But however, um, has nothing really much to do with it. Because if we can really connect back to um, a primordial experience of what life really is about, I do believe we uh, lose all of these uh, anxieties um, which uh, modern life actually brings uh, with it. There is uh, there is a lot going on there, and a lot of that is to do with your system. But we we're 15 minutes in, and this is the latest I've had to ask the hermetics question. So that was great, and I've got I've taken a lot of notes, so we can dip back into that. But before, Absolutely. But before we get any deeper, um, I have to ask you the Hermetics question, which is: you can place three thinkers, living or dead, in a room and listen in on the conversation. Who do you pick? Um, as Clargers is a sort of direct inspiration, who we spoke about in the previous episode. If he is one of yours, we can sort of take him as a given. So there's someone else thrown in who's new and. You know, yeah. Something new. So 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 let's let's take Clarges as a given. So no, mm. so now I can have like another three or another two. Another three. <laughs> have another three. Another three. Mm. Okay. Well, definitely I would put Nietzsche in. Uh, Nietzsche, I find him highly fascinating. So uh, however, I think Clarges and Nietzsche would, uh, you know, to a degree, get on very well. So we have to put like a disruptive element into it as well. So um, that would probably be maybe uh, Socrates. So, uh, you know, since Nietzsche and Klages had their issues with him, uh, it would be probably uh, kind of interesting to have him in the mix. Um, however, uh, since I'm an, an occultist, someone that I would probably like to see in there as well would be, uh, just because people will know him, I'll, I'll choose him rather than anyone else, I'll put in Alistair Crowley. Right. Just because, you know, he might have his ego exploded by these other guys. Because yeah. Crowley was like had a very big ego, he thought he knew it all. But these guys, you know, um, I think are um, intellectually a little bit superior to him, so they probably would take him, <laughs> disassemble him, you know, and we'll have a very very lively discussion. Yeah, uh -huh. let me see what's good. There's a lot going on there because, firstly, you would have, I w you know, Nietzsche would Nietzsche would probably be questioning Crowley as to why he's one of his ancient saints. Um, exactly. But that, but that list was extremely long anyway. I think Klages and Nietzsche wouldn't, yeah, like you said, they wouldn't get on with Crowley because, I mean, um, I, 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 find, I find Crowley and Crowley's work at Thelema really interesting, but I'm not exactly. a big fan of Crowley as a person. I don't, exactly. I don't exactly. think he's, but ultimately, none of, none of Thelema and Crowley-esque magic could have come from anyone but someone like Crowley. So True. it's a bit of a paradox. Um, True. But I think I think the the bit I don't like is like there's no point where I found ever found a redeeming quality in Crowley. So that's probably why. And I I wonder if Crowley would be a bit too much for Nietzsche. Like if it's if it's late Nietzsche when he suddenly went really shy, and yeah. he might just back away from him. Well, that or he might have uh, you know used him as one of these um, obstacles to overcome. You know, so he or he might have yeah. Or he might have just, you know, turned uh, around and said he's one of the marketplace types, so he's not talking to him at all, you know. Yeah. <laughs> so I can imagine, I can imagine that happened. But um, I, I love Crowley too. You know, Crowley was at least when I was a young man, uh, Crowley was a very big influence on me. Like probably a lot of, uh, you know, young, uh, you know, occultists had that experience. And like you said, there's a lot of interesting stuff in Salima. Of course, it's a very complex thing if you really go into it deeply. 
Uh, but Crowley, and even Crowley as a personality, I like it in a sense, you know. I was thinking maybe I'm going to, instead of Crowley, maybe I'm going to throw in the Makita Saad just for, you know, a colorful <laughs> personality, you know. We have something interesting to say, however, as well, apart from whips and chains. But, you know, it's... Um, I believe I believe Crowley and Nietzsche would be interesting, like you said. You know, they would be, they were discussing. You know, why do you make me a sign? Maybe you know. Um, and however, then they would have their issues. Probably Nietzsche would be probably not very happy with Crowley's interpretation of the will to power or the will. Um, you know. So and then and then uh, you know, Clagas would have a problem with both of these guys because of the uh, issue of the will. Um, so I. I think it would be, you know what I like? I like a lively mix. I wouldn't, and also I don't like it to be too abstract. And with guys like this, although they're all highly intellectual, you know, you could hope that there's a little bit of soap opera thrown into it as well. I think Socrates would be the one which, he would be the, the person who ends up, because the, the difference between Crowley Clarkers and Nietzsche are all relative, well, they all overlap, don't they, in terms of... Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. To, to Crowley, degree, yeah. Crowley is, Clark is basically his contemporary. In, in, well, exactly. In Actually, yeah, yeah. They're more or less all, all a little yeah. bit. Yeah. So that, that in, in, you know, yes. I think Socrates would probably be thinking, "What the hell happened between, uh, you know, <laughs> like <laughs> no, two thousand? What happened in two thousand years for this to be, yeah, yeah, this yeah. to now be the reality?" But I think that the, it's strange because the difference between in personality and character between Nietzsche and Crowley, like Crowley's the the final leap, like he finally pushes away and like dusts off the the remnants of Victorian society which Nietzsche is still sort of clinging to. And I don't know, I'm not sure, you know, Nietzsche and Vargas are still dandy, and Crowley was a dandy. I think he was, was like, I think, I think the young, dandiest yeah. of them was nearly Crowley, because Crowley was the one who lived constantly off his uh, inheritance. <laughs> he never had a job. You know, he kind of like lived like the Victorian gentleman. He, he never really was, in a sense, right? So uh, while Crowley, uh, at le- uh, while, while Clarkes at least worked for his living, you know, uh, uh, at least he tried, and... Uh, Okay, Nietzsche, partly he did, partly uh, I think my uh, sister took care of him or something, right? But uh, uh, I think, you know, I think I think Nietzsche was the most radical uh, because he came first and he smashed that entire metaphysical, you know, um, groundwork, which uh, basically everybody had based themselves on. And um, Crowley, yeah, Crowley came and kind of like, um, you know, took it and it took it as an opportunity to, you know, uh, you know, built something on top of that, you know, which made it more intriguing, probably to spiritual people. But, you know, I don't think there is so much more novelty there. I think, you know, if you look at Crowley's foundations, it's entirely Nietzschean. Um, and of course, you have some Schopenhauer there. Yeah? But, you know, take Schopenhauer away, take Nietzsche away from Crowley. And um, there's not so much more. There's not so much left there, you know, which is uh, which is very new. While I think Clarges has brought, although of course he also bases himself on Nietzsche quite a lot, you know, there is there is something there which uh, basically, um, you know, uh, kind of like takes Nietzsche to a new level. You know, he kind of discards some parts of Nietzsche, the Apollonian part, and, you know, he uses this uh, Dionysian part and then literally, you know, returns the Western philosophy or Western metaphysics into a, a more, let's call it an animist strata. Right, he basically removes he removes the entire idealism, the t- the entire Neoplatonic Platonic um, uh, structure from it, and uh, suddenly comes with something. Basically, he he connects not even to a, like Heraclitus, but like even way back, like he would probably say he he anchors in the elements, you know. Mm-hmm. And uh, and this is something I find for for someone, especially you know in in, in Germany uh, uh, during those days, although those days were quite wild, these, these you know, Weimar, Repu- Weimar Republic and so forth. But it was wild. I mean, to do something like this and be uh, such an intellectual uh, guy who was commanding so much of that um, intellectual terrain to do was, I mean, he knew, he must have known, he put himself outside any kind of discourse um, by basically... Um, being an iconoclast in the worst possible sense to the established university um, philosophers and metaphysicians. And so I guess Socrates would just take another, you know, a dosage of poison at that point, you know, you <laughs> probably have another suicide right there. So, um, yeah, I would just love to see this uh, clash of the titans, so to say. Okay. I think they'll, they'll, um, they'll all come back. I mean, obviously I haven't released the uh, Paul Bishop episode, but he, he picked Nietzsche as well. He picked, oh, he, he picked uh, Nietzsche, Heidegger. Um, Heidegger. <laughs> I was about to put see, I was about to put Heidegger in and maybe Goethe as well, but uh, you know, uh, uh, Heidegger. He, you know, I was about to choose Heidegger, he put but Pla- he, he put Plato. 
So oh, Pedro, you were okay. you were pretty you know pretty close. So you replaced yeah, yeah, yeah. You basically replaced Hardico with Brody. Those are two people who really wouldn't get on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. See, <laughs> I wanted I wanted to put Heidegger myself, but then Heidegger, you know, he's so dry. You know, he, his his philosophy is ultra wild. Mm. Um, but um, especially the late Heidegger, um, I really like. Um, but his 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 discourses are so dry when he speaks. You know, it it kind of puts me to sleep. Plus. Yeah. Half of the language I don't understand. You know, he, yeah. he kind of coins always new words, so you have to kind of like, you know. But you, you have trouble understanding Heidegger, but you don't have trouble understanding Plagas. No, so I have, I have, no, no, I can, I can deal with both, but I find Heidegger a lot more difficult than Klages because Klages very often ventures into a kind of mystical territory, which then I can easily relate to, and of course, intellectually, I can understand what he's talking about. But Heidegger, in my opinion, sometimes through his coinage of new phrases and terms. That he kind of gives completely new meaning to, or um, you know, he, unless you really study Heidegger uh, on his own terms and kind of like literally create a kind of a, a dictionary for Heideggerian terms, it's going to be very hard to understand. And I never got around to do that. So you could nail me if I would have chosen Heidegger, and you know a lot about Heidegger, you probably could have like uh, you could have spanked the metaphysical uh, <laughs> living daylights out of me. <laughs> I used to know a fair bit, but he's one of those people who's. Uh, system is so intertwined and complex that as soon as you uh, as soon as you, you you no longer are reading that stuff and you focus on someone else it starts falling away like if I read yeah. my my old uh, master's essays on Heidegger I just like oh man I can't believe I wrote this because uh, I can't make head to tails of it um there's something you said that really interests me before I even go into the questions that I've written and um, you said that you know when you're in Africa uh, and places outside of Europe um, the, the spirits are a norm. So people are working with spirits on a daily basis. And this yeah. makes me think of um, something Thomas Merton, the, like, the mystical Catholic, said in uh, Seven Story Mountain. And he says that the Church of England is, like a, is purely an aesthetic. It's like yeah. uh, English green, cricket, tea and scones. That's why people love Church of England. And it makes me think that when people are praying and saying grace and doing those actions which could be could be seen as mystical in Europe, they never are. That that entire metaphysical element in European and yeah, European and like American countries is yeah. is removed. Like it's it's not a um a pious or mystical or religious act. It's an act more related to politics and like personal character. Why do you why do you why do you think or where do you think that this what do you, what, you know, where do we turn wrong where we no longer even have this connection in you, like Europe? Well, I believe, like, uh, uh, and I probably uh, believe this w together with Klages, uh, it's probably the, the development of the spirit, or let's say the individuated self, which is so strongly dominant in Western culture. Like Western culture is all about the individuation. Um, this is basically the central uh, principle of um, uh, Western culture, how to be an individual, how to be, you know, uh, uh, an enlightened self. So this glorification uh, uh, of the individual, this individuating tendencies that we have, um, basically further and further has disconnected us from anything that's outside of this holistic, you know, this holistic thing that we call self. And um, it's 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 also visible, for example, in 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 um, I don't know if Paul Bishop talked about it. Probably did uh, because he's a specialist on, on him as well, like Jungian uh, psycho uh, psycho psychoanalysis and so forth. You know, um, like a lot of esotericists today say, well, esotericism is basically Jungian psychoanalysis. is is about like you know discovering your unconsciousness and bringing your unconscious uh, things to light. And the more of the unconsciousness that we uh, bring to light, the more individuated we become. And, you know, so basically uh, we, ha we, we presuppose a type of wholeness uh, where part of this wholeness is in the shadows, which is the unconscious. And part of it is in the light, which is the rational consciousness or the, you know, uh, consciousness. So uh, we have to basically in our process of um, becoming whole or real or, or, or individuated, we have to more and more understand these unconscious mechanisms and control them in order to become masters of our reality and masters of our lives. In Africa, this is um, absolutely not the case. In Africa, uh, basically the holistic individual in that sense doesn't exist. So the individuated person doesn't exist. 
So I think in some African country, I, I sometimes use this because it's kind of funny. There is an insult that you can call someone and it's called you individual you. <laughs> it's kind of like, you know, you curse someone out. That's what you say. Because uh, in Africa, uh, even the, the, the sense of self, the way it's constructed, is a multiplicity, a multiplicity of persons. It's like um, you're, you're, who you are is being constructed out by like a, uh, constructed by an ancestral soul. Then you have a kind of a, a spirit, a spirit that is part of who you are. Then you have all types of components, um, you know, which um, in the end take like a, you know, they have like five to ten different components who would, what makes the person, which they identify in a very prominent way. However, then they also have something like an unknown spot within yourself where you're constantly in exchange with, the let's call it the macrocosm. But the macrocosm as the macrocosm of ensouled life, where constantly there's an intrusion. So, you know, you're constantly changing and metamorphosing. So totally different from the Western individual who's always whole and static and who always fights not to be victimized by some kind of external force or um, even if that doesn't exist anymore, but an unconscious force, which even is part of himself only. Uh, but in Africa, there's that, there's, that, there's that idea that there's something outside of you and, and there's that vastly mysterious outside that constantly has the opportunity to intrude because there are parts inside of you which um, allow it to come in and enter inside of it. And constantly things are, um, so the puzzle pieces who make up who you are are constantly shifting. And so you're constantly metamorphosing basically um, uh, throughout your life. And, so, and then there are magical ways or means by divination and other ways in which you can control some of those aspects. You know, you can control fate to a certain degree. You can, um, you know, make things more favorable. Uh, but you can never um, believe that you have everything always under control. And the uh, uh, the desire, and uh, it, also in Africa, there's a desire to control your fate to a certain degree. But it's not so manic as it is in, 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 in the West, where, you know, we, we feel afraid. If we, we feel thrown into a, into a hostile world that we can't control. So everything we do on our daily basis, how to control it, we need to control it. And then we have the metaphysical support that says, well, you can control it because you are holistic within yourself and everything that's uncontrollable is just a part of you. You just have to kind of like discover it and bring it into harmony. Um, and this is something that's completely foreign to Africa. So Africa is basically still open. Um, to this wilderness that lies outside that little island of light which you have illuminated and which you have basically built a fortress around um, to protect yourself. So uh, in Africa, there are a lot of, uh, you know, drawbridges where these things come in and out. And um, so people are open for the cosmos to impact on them. And then they kind of, you know, deal with it in a creative way. Do you think that's why um, within modernity we're so fine deaf and suffering? suffering so abhorrent you know they are like the worst Absolutely. possible outcomes of of anything and they're not the way in which we deal with them especially death you know, deaths hidden away it's made as much as possible to be a mistake as opposed to a reality um, you know as deep dimitri all of recently said to me people don't people never die of old age anymore there's always some reason that could have been altered or cured by modernity but we were just a bit too late same with suffering like any form of suffering um, you know, and trying not to be too controversial here, but a lot of the mental, like discussion around mental health, I find it really bad because it's a discussion regarding completely getting rid of something which could be transformative. So instead of like, okay, well, what is this that I'm experiencing? What is this I'm feeling? Let's actually think this through. It's like block it out, take these drugs, and just ignore anything which is in the minest way, minorest way, uncomfortable. But of course, that exactly. that notion of comfort is basically created, right? That yeah. entire I think that's, idea yeah. of what is normal. It's like, it's like they created an idea of what is normal and then it's, they made you feel bad for not being in it. And it gets more limited all the time. I think it's a highly important question. I think the, a whole podcast can, can be done around this because <laughs> I think it's a, it's a central question. It's, it's maybe the central question for, uh, Western, for the Western world. You know, this, uh, you're right. And especially, you know, shutting everything out that's not normal. And today you can see it in all discussions. Like we, we especially now in the last 15 years, we live in a world where, you know, the discourse is basically um, uh, 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 taken over by people who have a very narrow idea of what's right or wrong. 
And, uh, you know, whether that's in politics, whether that's in whatever it is, it doesn't even have to even be mental health. So, you know, whatever is uncomfortable is blocked out, whether it's in social media. Oh, you know, they live in their little bubbles, in their little social media bubbles. Everything they don't like has to be taken out. They have to be a safe space. As soon as they hear something that they find upsetting, you know, they fall apart and, you know, uh, immediately it, it, you know, has to be has to be uh, removed. So in, in mental health, it's, it's, it's very important. Like and who defines what's 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 right and what's wrong, what's, uh, you know, mentally um, acceptable and what's not like is a child that's a little bit active already having a mental problem because it has like it's not diagnosed with, uh, I don't know. Uh, AH, what is it called? Like a a hyperactive syndrome or something? Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know? Yeah, I mean, you know, so so things change, you know, it's and everything changes according to, I think, and uh, probably uh, uh, John Cousins also has more to say about this. It's like, is it maybe it has to do with, you know, the human being as a commodity, you have to function in the machine, and your children and everybody else has to too. And everything that's not um, supportive to the functioning of the big machine, the big production process, the individual as a little wheel in the in the big machine, um, has to be basically rooted out. And, you know, they give you a certain idea of freedom. They give you a certain, um, you know, a range in which to maneuver. But if you really look at it, then, you know, there is not a big maneuvering range because, you know, it's just kind of an illusion. So, uh, and, 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 and death, uh, of course, it's, it's, it's the central question. I think, um, the, 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 the metaphysics of individuation, if we consider ourselves and our ego self and who we are, our self-conscious self to be what is real, then of course we are afraid of it to end because we know that death ends that self-conscious, um, being that we perceive of ourselves. Uh, And so we live also according to like a linear uh, type of time. We live on linear time. Um, Everything is a development. We project our goals into the future. This is how in Africa or in primordial, even in Klages uh, type of uh, philosophy, in my own uh, spiritual teachings, um, death doesn't really exist. There's just metamorphosis. The idea of death can only um, actually become so prominent um, in that sense that death ends something, if this type of ego-conscious personality is all there is for us. And if that's all there is, then death will end it for sure. And uh, then, of course, you know, we can only hope and produce some kind of, a, a, you know, illusion of a transcendental paradise where our, um, you know, constructed self, uh, our ego self will live on our personality. It's actually, you know, the deification of personality, you know, which is um, kind of unreal. So in Africa or in in a, in a primordial um, uh, uh, society, um, death also existed, but only as a big kind of initiatory experience from one state to another. So basically, um, death would just uh, turn the demonic personality or the the demon, the demon that has been um, embodied for a certain time. Um, actually just frees it of the body or releases it from the body. Freeing is not a right term because freeing would have some, something like positive, like, oh, it was bad before, now it's great. No, it actually releases the demonic self, the soul from the, um, from the, from the body and then just kind of uh, turns you into a more powerful, um, spiritual being that then continues to live with the community. So in Africa or in primordial societies, so the way I see it, um, the living and the death, the dead, they form a type of community. And this community, and you can still see it in Buddha and other places, you know, the dead are not gone. The dead are still there. And the living have an obligation. So the living and the dead basically um, do things for each other in order to um, allow themselves to participate in each other's different stages of existence. You know, the the dead as more powerful and more, um, let's say, uh, 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 unbound um, demonic uh, beings kind of in, enthuse and influence fertility and um, basically ordain and consecrate the life of the living, you know, help the community in, um, you know, teaching them through dreams and through visions and basically, um, you know, uh, uh, assisting them in their in their in the life uh, uh, which the community of the living still lives and the living um uh, allow the dead to return to life you know they give them food they allow them inside their bodies at times you know so there is a very very close uh, communion and the idea that the dead when they are served right will bestow powers upon you because the way you connect to them 
for a person who still believes that there is a possibility of an intrusion from the outside into yourself, there is something empowering in there. There's something enthusing, something that when you can connect to it, overcomes you and uh, provides you with a deeper knowledge or a deeper sense of being, a deeper sense of experience. So there's something that you gain from it, um, which uh, the people of today do not experience anymore because uh, the, um, the access has been blocked. The access to this type of uh, layer of experience has been blocked by uh, rational consciousness. I think even Bataille uh, uh, went so far as to uh, discuss these kinds of things. You know, he talked about ecstasy and have, uh, you have to overcome and break down your rational consciousness in order to, you know, break into uh, a type of different strata in order to be empowered by this, you know, kind of uh, dimension. So, um, yeah, I, I believe uh, this is why in those societies um, people do not fear death because for them, death is just a transformative, um, exp a transformative phase, which then basically um, puts you in another place, which, however, is still totally related with your um, living um, successors, you could say, right? So did your system not adhere to uh, the notion of linear time? Not at all. No. So linear time is something that we have to um, overcome in a sense. We have to, you know, uh, reconnect to a more cyclical reality where, you know, as I said, the, the, the living and the dead constantly, um, you know, uh, enthuse each other where, you know, um, li everything gets recycled in a way. And as Klages would say, um, you know, Nietzsche was correct in uh, proclaiming the eternal return, but not the eternal return of the same, but the eternal return of the same in ever new form. Nothing is lost in life. Uh, however, you know, the things that return are coming back differently. So, you know, um, it's uh, David, the way I am, or James, you know, you, you will, you know, we, we wouldn't believe or, or, you know, we don't think that you will come back in the exact same way that we are sitting here now. So that's not the cyclical um, reality I'm talking about, but more, you know, that something of us gets recycled in some way. In Africa, you know, there are some systems which believe that, let's say, some part of the grandfather goes into the grandson, you know, and then, you know, so he has, so basically there's parts of that, you know, so, so, so different parts of who you are go to different places in the cosmos and some may re-embody in a certain way, but the exact same composition that you are, because also the composition that you are changes all the time in the course of your embodied life, um, will never be, will never come again. And there is no there is no saving that exact setup that we um, think we can, you know, conserve over the course of a life. And even if we think about it rationally, you know, um, you're not the same person you were 20 years ago, and not, neither am I. Um, not our, not the cells in our body are the same, nor do we look the same, um, nor our, uh, are our experiences the same. And we can see it if we have a partner or a girlfriend or a spouse, you know, they say, like, well, you know, oh, you know, you changed so much. You're not the same person I met. Well, of course not. Hopefully not, mm -hmm. you know, because like, you know, the thing is, you know, we like to conserve the things as they were, as we know it. We like to, you know, carve the things out of the flux of time. We, uh, you know, we like to basically, um, the changing image is supposed to be turned into a thing we can possess, you know, that we can relate to and that never changes. We own it forever. And um, this is something, if it doesn't happen, which upsets us, you know, our, our possessive personality, our, our you know, um, the, 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 the thing who we are, the self-conscious being who we are, wants to possess and control. And everything that doesn't stay the same, everything that's out of our control um, is scary and uh, antagonistic. So we need to be controlling. So you see a lot of boyfriends or girlfriends being extremely controlling. They want to control who the other person is or turns into. And usually it's always, they should turn into something that's in accord with their own developments, right? So, um, yeah, this control fetish, this not allowing the world to actually change and flow as it is supposed to, you know, is, is one of the big um, obstacles to a happy life. This, you know, to channel uh, Klages, this is sort of to go back to the ancient, the ancient philosophical difference between uh, Parmenides and uh, Heraclitus, you know, so Parmen Parmenides... Uh, the the universe, the cosmos is being and it's done and that's it. And then Heraclitus with the famous, uh, you can't step in the same river twice, yeah. which is always sort of people confuse what that actually means, but it, it does mean what it 
they think it'd be. But anyway, the universe is perpetual change. Um, yeah. So instead of people, you know, modernity being scared of death, is it that we are um, we're truly horrified in in a term of sort of like Lovecraftian cosmic horror yeah. of of cosmic change? You know, I think we Absolutely. we can deal well. Actually, then again, most people can't even deal with the street sign changing, let alone <laughs> exactly. let alone. See? let alone the potential for sort of, you know, this is why I always have, this is one of the reasons I always have um, Flaps uh, pundits on, is because I love the, the idea that the entirety of society or the entire normalcy, mode of normalcy could crumble or could, yeah. there's a potential for that. Yeah. The, even the idea of a potential for that is yeah. abhorrent to some people, which is why Absolutely. the corona thing is so interesting is because it's like, I was about to even say that. when faced with the actual reality, all you hear is we'll be back to normal soon. Like this isn't yeah. something that this isn't normal. No, this is a mistake. This is yeah, a mistake exactly. of the universe. Exactly. It, you know, it's not change. Exactly. It's not flow. It's a mistake. And exactly. Yeah. So see the Corona thing. I was about to say because it's 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 perfect for us to actually observe the absurdity of uh, the way most people live. I mean, just just imagine. So now the only thing people are supposed to do is stay inside. You know. <laughs> Uh, try to watch, you know, just do everything you complain about all the time that you don't have time for. Stay inside, watch TV, read a book, you know, uh, have sex, whatever. You know, uh, sit in the garden, take a stroll. You know, everything that people usually complain, I don't have time to have sex, I don't have time to, like, you know, hang out with my friends, I don't have time to do this, I have to work all the time. And suddenly, you know, this, we we in the West, we are not used to um, not knowing what happens next week or the week after. You know, all we've done, also the way we've brutally exploited, of course, other places, is to secure our um, status quo. You know, the, the idea of securing the status quo is paramount in our lives. And um, so now that uh, the status quo is basically disrupted, and um, for the first time, I guess, in generations, I mean, of course, the war generation is kind of, see, now the war generation is kind of easygoing, you know, um, or the, the post-war generation, you know, that has, still has some memories of this. They're like, well, you know, they're, they're, you know, there are times like these, no problem. But, you know, this kind of um, entitled, uh, you know, uh, past two, three generations, I mean, ho holy shit, you know, these people are now terrified by not knowing what they have to do uh, in in three weeks or three months, so they have now there's a huge rise of anxieties, a, a huge rise of mental issues, you know, probably suicides, you know, and uh, it's, yeah, I can understand it maybe if you live in a place where if you lose your job you're on the street. Maybe in America it's a little bit worse, but you know you have uh, you have a, a good social uh, uh, welfare in 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 the UK. Um, not maybe maybe not after Margaret Thatcher so much as it was, but. Uh, <laughs> You know, but in Germany as well, we are we are still, you know, we we will not be out of bread and out of water, you yeah. know. Yeah. So now, however, I talk to my friends in Haiti, you know, people who forever live day to day. You know, they go out every day and have to fetch food. They don't know where the food's going to come. And I'm literally talking about rice and beans. They don't know where this food is coming from. Then they have civil war. They have, you know, this kind of problem and that kind of problem. And, um, you know, this this life of living day to day. Uh, week to week, not knowing how to feed your children, you know, this creates a, a completely different mindset. And if you are not prepared, if you have this very linear, linear time uh, type of thinking and type of personality, it's going to shatter you. And even the simple thing, sit at home, watch TV, you know, go outside only when you have to and wear a mask, it's too much for them. Yeah. You know, just, just even think about it. I mean, it's, it's, it's bizarre. It's, it's bizarre and it's kind of obscene, but we can hope that it maybe is a wake up call for some people, you know, and also a wake up call in regards to how we evaluate people from other countries. If we have other uh, people from other countries trying to, I don't know, um, you know, you can you can criticize, let's say, migration and everything. You know, um, I'm, I'm the last person who says, you know, you cannot debate this question or so. But, you know, one shouldn't, you know, so arrogantly often pass judgment. I'm like, oh, these people in Africa, oh, these people there, you know, they don't get anything done. Oh, look at this. You know, they're always complaining about everything. I mean, if you would live like them for one day, you would probably kill yourself, you know, because already now you develop suicidal thoughts because you have to sit at home for 24 hours, uh, you know, or you not even for 12 hours a day and watch TV. That's too much for you. And then you're complaining, however, about like those uh, Africans and those people who want to come to Europe and have a better life or, you know, um, that have civil war there and are complaining about it. I mean, you know, what doesn't touch you is very easy constantly to criticize. 
and to actually keep outside of your very, very, you know, um, picket fenced uh, life. What interests me here is, you know, you were, you were mentioning this, you know, the status quo, and this is what the West likes to do is to uh, cordon off, cordon off. You know, so we've got the normalcy, we've got the status quo, and anywhere we go, anything we do, it has to be like rigorized and stratified into like, good, we've got our thing of normalcy, anything that's either side of it, like, we don't want it, that's, you know, there's all the words, weird, bigger, fascist. You know, there's always different words around it. Anything sure. that's normal, but there's also words on the left. You know, like sure, sure, sure. Me, red, whatever. Yeah. It's whatever. Of course. Um, yeah. But this, do you do you equate this with the will to power? With the will to power, equate with what? With uh, like this kind forming, of like control forming, for the yeah, control. Yeah, control for the, yeah. Uh, normal, yeah, absolutely. Normalcy, normality absolutely. as a method of control. Absolutely, I believe that uh, the will to power, the way. It's exercised by 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 most people and 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 philosophically is, in my opinion, um, the drive of the impoverished. You know, if you are impoverished and if you are, it's 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 what the fearful do, the coward, the person of fear needs to control. So if you are, you know, making the will to power your paramount driving force of your life, it is because you feel disempowered, you feel impoverished. You feel um, you are lacking. Otherwise, you know you wouldn't have you wouldn't have the need to control. So I believe that uh, if the will to power is also the will to control and accumulate, then of course I believe it is. Um, yeah, it is. It is what makes the world um, sick, and it's the driving motive of the Western society: the will to power, the will to accumulate, this, to keep the status quo safe. And if we have the status quo, then it's have, we have to have a better one. See, the will to power is constant overcoming. So the constant overcoming is, is never good enough because we can always get more for ourselves, you know. And um, for, if you look at it um, from one perspective, from a simple perspective, you think, oh, yeah, it's the powerful who do that. You know, the powerful guy wants to be even more powerful because he can, right? But it's not. It's, you know, I think the true hero, even in the ancient sagas, the true hero is never really the one who, um, you know, is the biggest conqueror. It's 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 the one who actually sticks with fate. It's the one who, you know, fulfills his role in a most in the most laid back fashion. Um, you know, it's not it's never the one who is manically um, following some type of manic pursuit to gl to glory. You know, it's it's usually the ones who uh, try to find out what their fate is and live, you know, in respect of that. So um, yeah, the will to power for me is 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 one of the greatest. Um, the manifestations of the modern um, illness of the spirit, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a constant development of further alienation. We alienate ourselves further and further from the enthusing powers of the world because we further and further and more and more need to control everything. And uh, it also never gives us a moment of rest because as soon as we rest, we can't control, right? We can't exercise our power. It's the it's same as the rich people, you know. <clears throat> you think a rich person would be happy with five million, but if he's if he's if he's if he's poor, he's constantly concerned like how am I going to get food? How am I going to get this? How am I going to get that? If he has got twenty millions, he's going to be like, how am I going to how am I going to keep that money? And how about you know how can I make sure nobody takes it away from me? Mm -hmm. You know, and you know how can I make sure I get more because now my lifestyle is according you know to that uh, amount of money. So you never relax. You never live in harmony with what's around you. You're constantly, you know, setting your mind to um, abstract uh, goals that you are um, formulating. You never live in harmony with the here and now. You, so you never live in the now. You only always live in the future of something that you um, want to accumulate into yourself. You know, and it's and it's not you don't accumulate this into yourself to make you more powerful out of a a will to life it's it's like you know that would be a little bit different i would say there is a certain type of will to life which is uh, a type of impulse to live as deeply as you can and for me to live as deep as you can to allow basically that would be um you know how much does that um that life pulses through you you know so the measure of a person should not be how much he has accumulated but how deep he has lived really you know, and so the the will to life um, for me would be a, a type of uh, impulse to um, drink life as deeply as you can, which has nothing to do, however, with accumulating any type of uh, yeah um, possessive op opportunity.
But you know, even, 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 in, even in abstract, though, like no general possession, like not just uh, physical possessions, but the idea of uh, I, especially, like you were talking especially, about, like you were yeah. talking about with boyfriends and boyfriends and girlfriends, sort of the idea <laughs> of you have this clear cut girlfriend that you possess that yeah. image, yeah. and you're like, it's got to stay <laughs> that way, yeah, exactly. or, or or even you know, you could say property is an object, <laughs> but I always prefer to think about property as uh, more abstract than that. I think because yeah. the lines of, and you know, I'm talking about houses and homes. The, yeah. people, people get so funny you know there's yeah. like in their head they've drawn these imaginary lines and it's exactly. the the seeing what people do over over possession is uh that's when you start to worry about the um the sort of loss of options for people to buy but it's it was strange you know you're mentioning about um if pe- if we live just one day like uh you know people in haiti or people in africa um and i remember the images people were taking of shops uh, during corona and it was like okay. The one shelf they'd taken the picture of was empty, and then you look to the right, and it was foods they didn't really like. Sure. And you just think, exactly. hey, this is this is your this is your crisis is that exactly. there isn't the there isn't the food that you really like. Oh, That's we, right. We've 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 been eating plain pasta and or yeah. pasta and sauce. Okay. Yeah. But it but it's like the old the old joke and question, which is like, why aren't you know if all these occultists and all these sorcerers and all these uh, yeah. Uh, priests or whatever I have so much power uh, in yeah. exclamation in quotation marks. Why aren't they yeah. all rich? And like I, exactly. I think Greer at some point, John Michael Greer says, well, it's because they very quickly find out there's far more to life. You know, uh, it, it's kind of like I know you know a virtual untested is a no virtue at all. But like I've always said, just enough money so I can get the things that I would like and would like to do just to keep learning. Yeah, but, but at the same time, however, let me just jump in because yeah. that also is always always a very easy um, uh, get out for these modern occultists. They say like, well, you know, um, I'm a complete failure at uh, material life because you know I have set my uh, eyes on higher things and deeper things. Um, and the funny thing is, then, however, they still kind of like you know give courses on how to be materially rich <laughs> or you know how to summon that demon for this and that. You know, so this is, this is the funny thing. So the thing is. You know, I also believe that if you are a total failure at life, you know, and uh, at material life, however, you claim to be a great occultist, you know, something doesn't really match. I think, you know, I think you have to be able to get by rather easily if you're a good magician, you know, so that's that is an aside. But I think you you nailed it pretty well when you said, like, also, especially the will to power in regards to ideals. For example, take the girlfriend example, you know, it's not enough to control your girlfriend, it's then to turn your girlfriend into an ideal. So you're not happy with who she is, but you're going to have her put implants, get her lips, you know, um, <laughs> tuned. you know, you kind of start to, you know, manipulate so that she creates, so that she becomes an ideal, which you want to have and which you want to um, achieve and um, accumulate into your pocket. And you don't, and, and, and what happens when you chase after ideals, and it could be, uh, it could be something totally abstract it could be you know I, I don't know some kind of ideal you know that you set for yourself in regards to metaphysics or so but the thing is when you when you set these types of ideals you never actually engage with what's here and now you can never engage actually with the phenomenal reality but it's always a type of fantasy that it's projected that never is tangible in a sense and i mean not you know tangible in that possessive thing, uh, possessive way but it's it's you know it's it takes you out of that um demonic pandemonium you know which you could actually um connect with in a much more meaningful way so cosmic gnosis your system is is in like very short is that is this system basically about ways and why we should escape this westernized possessive nature and if so well yeah if so in what ways uh in what ways you know if you can or i don't know if it's a uh, you know, highly initiatory, I believe it yeah. is, but highly initiatory. But if there's any hints of uh, the practices that you give or sure. the minds, how to develop yes. how to develop a mindset of uh, yes. escaping this would be a better way yes. to put it. Yes. So I think we have basically laid out very well what what the what the problem is in modernity, like how we live and what this is, you know, what problems this creates. So yeah. So basically it is a way to overcome that type of um yeah, rational, transcendental um 
Überbau, you know, uh, uh, which is um, like a veneer over our experience, which takes us out of this experience. Yeah, so basically the way we live, this linear way of living, this um, disconnected way um, that we live with nature and, and everything in it, this kind of uh, way of life is overcome uh, in the work that we do in the cosmic nose. So we want to return to a more um, dynamic relationship with the phenomenal world itself. So how do we do this? Uh, basically, it's a kind of like an alchemical work, you know. You uh, so you first of all you have to question um, your rational mindset. So you know you have to slowly try to move out of that rational um, idea of self or the rational constructed self that you have. And how do you do this? Well, maybe you start to live more close to the cycles of nature. So, you know, return to more cyclical reality by, I don't know, trying to live more seasonal, you know, buy more seasonal products, simple things. Um, or like Heidegger in his uh, older days in the in the Black Forest hut, you know, surround yourselves with images um, which remind you of the cyclical reality, like, you know, symbols of death, maybe. Like, I think Heidegger had a coffin or something like this uh, in, his, in his hut or something that reminded him of, like, death is not something scary, but death is something that's, you know, um, a part of everyday life. Um, you know, try to get in touch um, in a in a very very um, yeah conscious way with what's actually around you. Take walks outside, and rather than you know just kind of like um, aesthetically engage uh, with the beauty of your park or something like this. You know, try to pay attention in a more um, intimate way to what you encounter on the way. Um, you know, a kind of more so the simplest ways for everyone would be a more conscious relationship with the environment that you live in try to engage with nature if you don't if you live in a city try to get out more and try to try to see how when you consciously move through nature and you know observe its you know brilliant me or different manifestations you know how this could impact on you try to like lose yourself in a beautiful sunset you know, and um, um, I don't know if you spoke about this with Bishop, uh, you know, the idea of um, allowing the uh, uh, ma the macrocosm nature, for example, to uh, kind of like uh, overcome you. This moment of losing your identity in, let's say, the contemplation of a, a sunset or a beautiful landscape. You know, the moment where you, you know, I mean, everybody probably had that, you know, when you're on holiday and you look outside, you know, you see the ocean and the sunset and suddenly, you know, you realize you've been gazing at it for five minutes, but you weren't conscious of it. Right. You were just kind of lost. You were, you know, and, and this is what it is. Losing your eye, losing the uh, everyday conscious self that we usually move in. And after you kind of like come out of that, uh, you know, moment of contemplation, this moment of like being basically overtaken by this demonic force of let's say the sunset you know it's kind of you feel empowered you feel like wow you know and it's not that it, that you blanked out you, you take something with it you take something out of it and while you were in it something happened to you something you know um th th there was something that all the senses together experienced so you know i i try to teach people a type of more holistic um engagement with what is outside of them so that all their senses can basically reconnect to um, the place they live in. So uh, that, you know, um, they do not perceive the world um, purely through their rational mind and through their analytical mind. When they see a forest, it's not that they see just uh, different trees which they can analyze, but, you know, that they can allow the forest to uh, basically unveil itself to them. That the tree that they stand in front of or the ocean which they gaze at can basically open itself up to them. But for this to happen, you have to have a certain contemplative, passive state, which allows you to kind of connect to it. So um, we have various ways to do that as, as a contemplative exercises, meditational exercises, but also initiations or um, actual work with spirits, actual work with, um, you know, demonic forces, but demonic, not in a sense as negative. When I say demon, I mean like um, enthusing powers, or as Klages would say, images, right? The changing images of the world, which, you know, have a way of enthusing you and empowering you. And while they empower you, you give life to them, you renew their force. So, you know, and when they empower you, or when you connect to them, something happens with you and it makes you more creative. Um, and if those uh, interact, if this interaction becomes very intense, um, 
you become basically forced to um, translate this experience into something productive. You will become, I don't know, more creative. You will become a better you know, lover or boyfriend or, you know, you know, you, so, so let's say like this, the, the engagement with uh, living forces never leaves you just dry or, um, you know, empty once you have, uh, you know, come back to your rational mindset. But, you know, it, these, these, these tremendous experiences, especially if you know how to do it more and more kind of like lead to a fuller life which also, you know, kind of like manifests itself in some type of manifestation. You manifest it in your personality, in your credit, in your creativity, in the way you interact with people. Um, it doesn't, it doesn't stay just, uh, it, it, it doesn't stay a mind game, you know? Do you, do you think that before you can undertake this contemplative way of um, perceiving reality there, that you, Michel Serre has this, this idea that, the invasive and controlling culture that we've um, that sort of has invaded us and controls us, um, that that has transformed our minds and the way we perceive into what he states as economizing. So, like instead of seeing trees now or a forest, our mind doesn't see it in that way. It's like, what could I do with this? You know, everything is utility. Everything yeah. is you know, there's there's profit loss. If we cut those yeah. logs down, we could turn it into yeah. something. So yeah, so. What I'm trying to say, and this is sort of alongside the idea of um, judgment in Plaga's work. So like the idea yeah. that our perception is constantly judging as opposed exactly. to uh, visionary, what, what he calls exactly. what he says. So do you think that before one can be contemplative, there has to be a uh, mode or action of like stripping back, you know, whatever the uh, the filth of modernity that's been like layered yeah, onto our brain. So. But how do you get rid of that? That's the key question. Well, right? like, how I, I guess I guess it has to be. I guess it has to be um, a mixture of theory and practice. I think you have to first of all, you know, rationally understand a certain, um, you know, Weltanschauung worldview, which kind of like um, explains what is going on. Because you have to have a frame of reference in which you can place your experiences, right? So let's say I don't know, you read something of Plagas, or you read, um, you know, uh, some of my work, or, or or you come to me and talk to me, or you hear talk, or you hear a podcast. You know, this already may be a, a first trigger for you to kind of like reevaluate what's going on. So, um, however, uh, some of these mindfulness teachers also they try, you know, they, it seems oh they're going in a similar direction, which is not really true because also it's not only about kind of like um, aesthetically um, respecting you know nature or something like this because you know um, some people think oh that's already enough I, I i like the environment you know like oh i'm environmentally um uh, conscious but that's really not a, that's that's not that's really not about what it really should be about because even you so like let's look at like the the environmental movement the environmental movement really doesn't care for the environment per se on its own terms it cares for the environment because it they're afraid that if the environment collapses they collapse they think the the, the environment is still seen as a commodity you know it's like oh you know we we are killing all the species we're killing the planet so we're all going to die so that's their big fear they are going to die it's a very selfish um you know idea of uh, of what the environment is really about and also you know to even be so arrogant and say that they can save the environment if the environment collapses in a sense, uh, and if it only collapses in a way that will wipe out maybe humans, it still is there, and the environment still goes on. Life goes on, the cosmos moves about, and, you know, probably a billion stars away, everything is fine, you know? So the thing is, you know, this this arrogance even of humans saying, like, we have to save nature, we have to save the planet. The planet will be there regardless of whether you're going to be wiped out by some kind of, you know, climate change or not. Um, and uh, life doesn't care for your, um, you know, sentimental, moralistic um, explanations of life. So um, I think what we have to really do, um, uh, we have to also break the layer of um, some kind of sentimental um, appreciation of, let's say, beauty, which is also okay at first. You know, this is okay to have as a first step, you know, because I think some people are so desensitized that they can't even appreciate any more like mountain range, mm -hmm. you know. There's a look at fine, you know, but I'd rather be at home playing PlayStation. So, you know, you have people so desensitized that, you know, natural beauty doesn't move them anymore. So their soul is kind of dead. But, uh, yeah, I believe, you know, it has to be more than that. You have to be, you have to understand that life is uh, an ocean of living images of uh, 
a, a myriad forces that manifest themselves in a phenomenal appearance. Like Klage says, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, the body is the manifestation of the soul, and the soul is the meaning of the living body. So, you know, we need to understand that the trees, the, um, you know, the landscapes, the way the tree interacts with the sky and the clouds, all of these are demonic, enthusing images and forces which have their own individual right um, and life uh, with uh, which we can connect and um, it is not some kind of like you know it's it's not a planet that we animate through our consciousness or it's not a life that we decide how how it should happen and how it should be like it's something that we must uh, 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 respect more in its own terms and we must evaluate it because we understand the uh, individual intrinsic value of each image which um, appears in the cosmos or which wants to appear in the cosmos but if there are no souls to receive it um, they can't even appear so uh, you know we have to understand our relationships to um, what is alive in the cosmos and our and our understand our position in it and and and, and what it does and then we can appreciate nature on its own terms. We can understand what it is. We can live more deeply. We can connect to those forces in a more meaningful way. We connect. To the, we can connect actually to the forces. So even in, in in choosing how to and connect with which forces, so they can actually impact on us in a certain way. We can actually choose um, how to move about, and then have uh, you know the world help us in our um, everyday life. How to be more creative here. How to be better there. So. Um, we can become a completely, or let's put it like this, the way that we can interact with the world can totally change um, our idea of power and possibility of what life yields to us. Well, I think one key question, because there's this, there's an idea, and this came up quite a bit with, with Bishop, and there's, there's serious similarities that I see between Eastern modes of thought, uh, specifically Buddhism. So you have this idea, like the, the, the almost cliche Buddhist idea of like, you see a flower, you leave it, but you appreciate it, right? But, and this is one of the things I said to Bishop is, um, sort of spanning from Klager's work and the cosmic, what it seems to be like in the cosmic gnosis was work, mm -hmm. there is a clear difference mm -hmm. because this is still a Western system. Yeah. And it, 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 Klager's never comes across as an, in any way, Eastern stereotypically. So it's a Western system which just does not feel Westernized at all, except that does feel that there's a difference. And I just I just can't, I'm struggling to find the difference between, like the difference between that and like more Buddhist modes of yeah. being present yeah. in the now. Because that's a classic yeah. Buddhist thing yeah, right? yeah. with mindfulness is uh, yeah. live in the now. Um, yeah. But this is different for Clarkus, right? And I'm assuming different yeah. for uh, Cosmic Gnosis. It's a very interesting question because um, when you look at those uh, most of those Buddhist thoughts or or Eastern thoughts, when they live in the now, they mean they live in the spirit, which means you know of course they posit the ontological superiority here is with the spirit, with the transcendental, the nothingness, or whatever you want to call it. For them, the material or the phenomenal world is an illusion, right? So when they say, it's the same as with Sufis, for example. Sufi thought is very important to me. I love it. Uh, I've studied it a lot. So, however, um, when they appreciate um, phenomenal life, it's out of compassion for um, often, of course, I, don't, I cannot speak for all Buddhists or for, you know, it's, my, it's, it's a very, very quick uh, breakdown of, of how I see certain things. So, you know, it's, it's out of compassion for also those confused creatures who not yet understand that they actually are not that phenomenal world, that they do are that they actually have no part of it, that the phenomenal world is but like a dream, you know, that uh, their real selves is transcendental that their real selves is beyond the veil of Maya or, you know, whatever you want to call it. I think uh, so. So basically, um, it creates a very, very ambiguous relationship with, re with material or phenomenal reality. It uh, basically goes as so far as like, you know, some Christian saints. It's, it's, it's there, but it's not there. You know, it's like they, they, they have kind of like um, disconnected their mind or their spirit so much from the physical reality um, that um, they don't even perceive it anymore because uh, the real is the ideal, is the ideal realm. 
Um, and this is this is what the true essence of these teachings is. Um, the phenomenal world is an illusion. Identification with it, as Klages or the cosmic gnosis would do, ident identification with the phenomenal world is basically falling into the illusion and living the illusion as real. So if you appreciate the phenomenal world, it can only be in 100% total consciousness of that being like a dream that you can move in and however it's not real so whatever happens so so basically to to say it in a really radical way you don't really have to care for the world or for the phenomenal reality because it's not real it's just a kind of dense um uh you know a f a phantomic theater um uh, uh that is a uh a, a, de de a degeneration or you know some kind of uh, uh, illusionary spinning of the transcendental ongoings mm -hmm. so um basically it devalues radically the phenomenal reality. So the only place I could see being totally in sympathy or in great sympathy with the cosmic gnosis of Plagas would be Shinto. Um, Shinto, uh, the, the Japanese uh, tr indigenous uh, traditional um, religion, um, would be uh, something where, you know, um, the kami, the spirits uh, uh, of nature manifest in all the places of nature. So nature basically is... Um, and sold, but not in like one big world soul that splinters off in all these myriad different little souls. But, you know, um, the spirits, however, um, is what the spirits are, the visible world, basically. So, you know, like Clarence would say, the environment, nature, basically manifest is manifested by, um, you know, living spirits who basically um, are then worshipped. Um, in different places around, you know, the country in, in, in their temples and so on. And Klages very often, of course, refers not so much to the East, but he refers always to, you know, tribal people. He calls it the Pelasgians, mm -hmm. you know, which is basically kind of a um, a major term for all more like tribal, um, you know, um, tribal animistic primordial thought. Um, so yeah. So, however, there is one. I don't know. You you you've read in the book that I that I um uh, that I sent you. Uh, there is a, a Buddhist who actually um, wrote a lot about um, Klages or was influenced by him was uh, Anagarika Govinda, right? Mm -hmm. um, and Falka Tsats, who contributed uh, to one of our books, um, he would be an interesting person to ask because he knows of uh, various Buddhists in Japan, especially, who have taken very great inspiration from Klages. And have started to like reformulate the idea of Maya, that Maya is actually something to be engaged with. It's not a negative veil, but it's something, you know, um, it's, it's like the pandemonium that you can engage with. So they have a very heretic view on those kinds of matters. So just to sort of clarify that, do you, you, the cosmic gnosis system does accept the, the Numena phenomena split, right? Yes. So do you have any relationship with the, the Numena? Or is it purely phenomenal? In what sense well, then, if you know that the phenomena, and, and, and in what sense yeah. you know the phenomena is this dream, this uh, illusion, this veil? In what sense can you gain any truth from it? Or well, I don't think I don't think it's the veil. I don't think it's the veil. See, oh, okay. I think the I think that's that's what the Eastern thought would say, right? The Eastern thought says that the phenomenal reality is basically um, uh, a false reality that it's spun by I don't know Maya uh, or some something like that. It's uh, it's spun by you know it's 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 what keeps us entrapped uh, and allows us not to not to move to higher transcendental spheres outside that phenomenal reality. So I believe that the phenomenal reality is that reality that we are positively engaging with or should be positively engaging with. I think. Uh, what's the what's the new mena then? What's the new mena? The new mena, in my opinion, are like phantoms. They're like the negative in, you know, if you if you uh, want to speak about it in religious terms, it's it's like the it's 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 like the negative angels. It's like, you know, it's these uh, it's the forces created by the spirits. It's even kind of projections of the spirits of, uh, you know, it's it's something that tries to it's, it's something that tries us to divorce us from the phenomenal reality. It's something that tries to take us out of the engagement um, with uh, the world that we live in. So the noumena or the, the, the ideals or, you know, uh, the forces which are deriving from the ideals are these um, seductive little phantoms which uh, tries to seduce us into um, more and more disconnecting from a physical 
um, and phenomenal reality. And you can see, um, you know, I remember, was it uh, Bernard of Clairvaux, the, you know, the, 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 the famous priest who called for the Crusades? Uh, I think, you know, one of the biggest thinkers of Christianity, you know, a, a very interesting person to read and stuff. But I think he was the one who, when he was like, you know, carried through like the be most beautiful landscape in the south of France, he actually um, had uh, people veil him because he didn't want to be seduced by the satanic demonic powers right. of the beautiful landscape. So, you know, it's, you go to those lengths, you know, so, to, so to, yeah. So to look, to take that as a metaphor, like he was veiled so that, so that, you know, if he was unveiled and he saw this beautiful, what he considered demonic landscape, then That's that right. would have led him away from the, the spirit or the ideal Exactly. Of the Crusades, which he followed exactly. through. Exactly. So or the had, ideas so of, he, of God, or the ideas of the transcendence. So he had a noumenal abstraction, which he was adhering to, sort of like, exactly. an, sort of like an ideology or a collective or a, an abstract desire, or like the force of capitalism. He, they right. were, they, you were adhering right. to them as opposed to saying like, uh, I don't know, that sunset's beautiful. And, That's right. And, and paying attention to those phenomenal moments draws us back in, which isn't wanted by the spirit, which actually exactly. like the spirit and the numena have That's this it. demonic ability to draw That's us right. away from what is just immediate to us. The logos or the spirit or, you know, the numinous forces, which are probably, you know, um, uh, uh, deriving from the logos, you know, these are the forces exactly which want to divorce us from this, you know, phenomenal seduction. You know, so um, this, this uh, you know, uh, Bernard, I think it was, you know, yeah, he went through, uh, he, and he... He didn't want to, uh, you know, upset uh, the logos that he was serving, and um, so of course, you know, he knew that once he was um, exposed to those, uh, you know, uh, to those landscapes, to those de demonic, uh, you know, forces of the landscapes, probably because he knew his soul was still very active, he would probably be lost in that, uh, you know, erotic um, uh, 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 seduction there, which he believed to be negative. And you can see it also in some of the desert fathers. Um, I think, you know, there was one. I don't know who it was. Um, who was, you know, in the desert, you know, for, for, for decades, you know, literally living like an ascet, you know, kind of like castigating himself all the time, you know. And then he was, uh, at one point he was like saying, oh, you know, I'm here, you know, day by day, Lord, why are you doing this to me? I'm here, you know, for decades, you know, castigating myself. But every night I dream of the horse in Rome, you know, yeah. so every, the yeah, poor guy. A, you know? There's another Desert Father's story where one one is in the desert and he's, one of his things is to stay sober, eat plain foods and uh just meditate all day and then because of his uh because of the fact in the christian logos you'd have to be generous someone comes along and offers him wine and it's like yeah. this complete paradox of like he's really <laughs> enjoying the wine and he yeah. has to accept it because because it's yeah. the generous and the correct thing to do but it's against everything else so it's like he's yeah. he's had to enjoy i guess what you'd understand is, or yeah. the cosmic gnosis would be like he has to en enjoy the uh the phenomena but at the same yeah. time, he's uh, he's losing his ideal. Yeah. But but doesn't exactly. want to probably doesn't want to start at the beginning. Yeah, he's like, I doesn't, enjoyed this, but oh yeah, doesn't want to admit. Not. Doesn't want to admit yeah. that like the simplicity of like, oh that was nice. Yeah, uh, you know, doesn't want to admit to that. So, yeah. is there any um, traditionally re religious aspects or deities in the the cosmic gnosis system? Well, you could use some. I mean, you know, you, as I said, uh, for example, I'm I'm also a voodoo priest, so I believe uh, the you know the the spirits of voodoo, for example, are perfect expressions of uh, you know um, the forces um, which we connect with uh, when we take this phenomenal reality as the true reality. Um, there are other there are other um, uh, 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 pantheons, you know, I'm, I'm writing a book right now on Adonism. It's it's not very non, but it's a, it's a German, um, you know, early 20th century um, uh, pagan type of uh, 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 system. Um, they have some they have some deities like from Astarte to Baal to you know um, all types of others. Um, yeah, so um, I think any type of animist system, for example, whether you give name, and of course you have to you have to you have to see it like this. When people create a pantheon, especially if they kind of connect to the environment in its manifold expression, um, some things for a tribe, for example, becomes more, poor, more important than other things. A tribe that lives in the desert, for them rain and um, vegetation probably becomes more important than um, for um, you know, a tribe that lives um, at the ocean. So probably a deity of the ocean for a desert tribe doesn't play a role. So although you know, um, an ocean 
force or an enthusing force of the ocean or the waves and so on and so forth exists. But for desert tribe, even, you know, a person in the, in the desert tribe may have seen it once, doesn't really play an important role. So uh, I think a pantheon um, at, uh, at times is um, created by which forces are more paramount or more enthusing to us or to a group um, in a certain period of time. Uh, or in a certain environment. So, of course, you know, the environment in which you live plays a huge role of where, what you connect with. You know, if you live in the jungle in, in, in Brazil, I, I used to live in Brazil. So, you know, if you live in, in, I don't know, Manaus in the jungle, you will connect to different, um, environmental forces than, um, if you live, I don't know, in the Lake District, you know, in the UK. So, um, so I guess a pantheon, yes, certainly. If you if you care to name, but we have to also then um, be very careful that the uh, that creating a pantheon. So either you can create your own, or you know you can actually use one that's already there. But we have to be very careful that um, creating a pantheon then doesn't kind of personify and abstract, make abstract. I don't know the English word. So to make abstract that which is a dynamic force that we do not reduce the vitalism of a force that we can give a name to or um, you know a, a symbol or a color. Um, that this doesn't then become um, nothing more but like a personified construct of our imagination, of our wishful thinking. There are plenty of those, nearly all of those ritual esoteric systems in the West, in my opinion, un, are, have no, absolutely no connection to, to actual, let's call them demonic forces, even if they talk about the Goetia or they talk about, you know, polytheism. You know, we have all kinds of polytheist, uh, you know, reconstructionist uh, systems everywhere nowadays. But um, um, these people kind of construct their images of Hecate or, you know, whatever god or goddess they they, they want to deal with, Odin, uh, Wotan, whatever, you know, is, is also popular uh, everywhere. You know, but these people construct these gods according to their projection of what these gods should be like. Basically, it's a transfer of, you know, oh, I don't agree anymore with, you know, I don't know, the Christian God because, I don't know, it's boring or, you know, I don't know, and they have some reasoning for that. So they just transfer that type of approach to um, a more polytheist model, but it's as logocentric, it's as abstract, it's as projected, it's as spirit-based uh, as it was before. So it has nothing to do with real paganism. Um, a real pagan um, experience of the world, like Klages would say, or the cosmic Gnostics, or like, you know, you would find in Brazil in the jungle or so, you know, um, a pagan, re a pagan experience of the world is about how you connect in your soul to the forces of the universe, how you're able to deconst, to, 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 uh, destroy your rational consciousness, um, through, you know, rigorous exercises so that, you know, it's not your uh, rational consciousness, not your, your mind that connects to these types of forces, which they can't, but it's your soul that does it. You know, it's like, uh, and that's why Bataille, Klages, and all types of ecstatics have created all these ecstatic rituals, you know, in which in ecstasy they rip apart their identity so they, uh, their soul can explode out into the cosmos and connect and mate, basically, with these forces, you know. And um, yes, you do have ecstatic exercises, let's say in Sufism and stuff like this. And um, so a lot of things are the same. However, the Sufis or these, um, uh, if they are so, or the Buddhist or so, if they are already so um, uh, complex in their work, however, the last step they take is the wrong one because in the last consequence, when the eye ruptures, you know, they project and tr want to connect with the transcendental source, you know, with the, you know, root of all things for them and it's not the cosmos that they want to pour themselves out into so you know it's uh, it's it's the one is the ascent and the other one is the katabasis basically so i'm a person of the katabasis the descent into the underworld the descent into the ketonic realm the descent into the cosmic pandemonium um mm -hmm. while others um, if they are even so sophisticated you know um choose to break the eye apart in order to merge with an even more transcendental um with the source that gave them even, you know, that eye consciousness. So, 
the the, the modern uh, esoteric systems, however, are all quite vacant, um, with very rare exceptions. So th I don't even put them in the same class as Buddhism or you know uh, Hinduism or any type of you know sophisticated system. I mean, these guys are just um, basically playing theatrics um, with um, you know projections of. Uh, you know, fantastic deities and 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 images which they find pleasing to their aesthetics. Um, you know, and give a little bit more color and meaning to their kind of vacant lives. You know, as controversial as that will sound now, but that's the truth of the matter. Um, and that's what you can see um, in most uh, spiritual uh, movements, uh, neo neo spiritual movements in the West. It's kind of desperate people trying to have a you know a good time and connect to something, although they usually fail at doing so. You know, and at best it's an intellectual exercise. At best, you have some scholars. Is there any Western Western spiritual movements sort of like from 1900 onwards that you would consider consider serious? Well, yeah, I would consider probably serious, like you know, the, an Adonism, which um, I, I know very few people in in, in English speaking world know about it, but uh, this is very interesting. That's why I'm writing a book about it to introduce it in in, in in England, or in in the English speaking world, um, so to know more about this. But you know, offhand in the West, I don't really see it. But of course, I, I probably don't know all of them. But um, I, yeah, there is there is some there is some interesting stuff with uh, some you know neo pagan systems. You know, like uh, some Lebensreform. You know, in, in I think in Germany especially, there was a lot of stuff going on. You know, our post Nietzsche. You know, like a lot of new models of, you know, thought of you know, trying to, you know, live closer to nature and stuff like this. But I don't think there was any kind of like initiatic system, some kind of organized system that would uh, would lead you to that kind of place. Not really. No, what I don't you, think so. What about the really modernized things? So, uh, Metic Order of the Golden Dawn, Thelema, Gurdjieff, Fourth Way, any... any there is very critical about it. I mean, I used to be very close to Thelema, and I'm still having a, a weak spot for Crowley, as you know, right? And uh, Thelema, and I think, however, the problem is, they all base themselves on the Judeo-Christian model of transcendentalism. So it's like Neoplatonics, uh, basically. You know, they all have the Tree of Life, and then you all have, like, you know, Ayin, Ayin Sof, Keter, you know, which is all these uh, non-manifest and, um, you know, uh, transcendental realms. And from there, everything trickles down. So basically, um, all their work, and it, I, I even um, throw in the right-hand path, the left-hand path. They're all, they're all, however, trying to ascend to utilizing or merging with a supreme source of which everything else depends on, or from which everything else basically emits. And this emission theory is something that really, really doesn't work for me at all. So. You know, I do not believe, um, or I, I, let's, let's put it this, I, I do not believe that any path that adheres to any type of emission theory where the phenomenal world or the world in which we live in is thought to emit from a pure place, which, however, now we live in a flawed place because the more dense, um, you know, the uh, emissions become, the less pure, the less holy um, the life is or uh, the uh, reality is. Um, this means, however, always that the reality that we find ourselves in must always be devalued in relationship to that transcendental reality from which everything supposedly originated. And usually it's originated by either a command, um, a conscious act, something like this. There's always a presupposed unmanifest consciousness which controls uh, the entire, um, you know, development and evolution of uh, reality and this is something i completely reject so uh, because if you do this eventually always what happens is that you devalue um, the phenomenal universe you devalue everything that you find in the enthusing ocean of images which gives manifestation to the world so um and this, and so, so for me, as long as, as soon as you um, connect or um, adhere to some kind of Neoplatonic, idealist, transcendental type of system, um, you go in the wrong direction. So you may use some techniques, which I also use. You may um, speak about, you know, ecstatic states or whatever, you know, which I all can relate to in a sense, you know, but I know that the path that you ultimately take is leading you outside of this world, outside of this cosmos, outside of this pandemonium. 
um, into some kind of um, abstract space, mm-hmm. you know, where basically you just are confronted with a nothingness. No power, there's no vitalism there. Mm-hmm. So I want to remain in a vital universe with which I engage in a vital way. Um, so basically, I'm a, I, I would be esoteric life philosophy would basically be the label you could put on me if the other ones would be, I don't know, as esoteric neoplatonists or something. So, um, yeah, so I, I, I have to. And, and that's the problem in the West. All the Western systems are based on a, a Judeo-Christian neoplatonic model, um, in, including all the neo-pagan um, systems. So. Although they don't know it, they reject, let's say, Judeo-Christianity. However, the structure is completely logocentric. The way they think, they don't understand that in that the, the logocentrism is not in choice. The logocentrism is not by choosing, I don't know, um, Odin or some Wicca goddess uh, or you know the the great mother over um, you know Godfather or Jesus Christ or the Holy Spirit. It's about how do I experience reality. Logocentric or biocentric or logocentric or, you know, animist or whatever is not a, a conscious choice, is not, you know, how you respect nature or how you respect a plurality of gods that you consciously think and consciously, consciously choose to be your pantheon. Um, but it's a certain type of way of connecting to what's real. That's what I, that's what I deeply believe. So, um, Someone who works in a logocentric way, someone who doesn't, who only has a logocentric experience in life and whose path is to basically um, sharpen and intensify the logocentric abstract reality and thinking that he finds himself in is doing exactly the opposite of what I'm trying to do. Um, I think that's, that's pretty clear and concise. If there's anything you feel like we've missed, I know that you're a relatively, not secret, but you don't sort of publicize the uh, your group so if people find it they will find it of their own accord um, but if there's anything you feel we've missed or misinterpreted uh, is there anything you'd like to add well I think actually we touched upon some really important points and um, you know um, I think let this stand for what it is uh, at this point and uh, I think maybe in the future we can do a uh, Another one, if people enjoy what they're hearing, and um, then we can, um, you know, deepen some things or, uh, you know, take another topic. But I think, no, I think it was a very interesting conversation. I think a lot of important things were discussed. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. No, I, I I think everything, especially for an audience who may not be so familiar with uh, esoteric thought or a crossover between esotericism and Gnosticism and, uh, you know, philosophy, I think um, as an introductory you know, laying out of the terrain. It was pretty, uh, pretty interesting. I don't know how do you, how do you feel about that? Yeah, no, I think, uh, I think we did a good job. It's difficult to get what it's. It was, it was good that you uh, explained ideas which, without assuming any familiarity. That's the difficulty. Yeah. Well, I, exactly. So for me, that's very difficult. But I tried it, and I hope, uh, especially with um, uh, Paul Bishop's talk, which uh, you probably. Um, will, uh, you know, upload a little earlier than ours, um, it will provide uh, another interesting foundation maybe to some of the things uh, that we have discussed because, you know, we are maybe like, a, or, you know, I have probably esotericized some of those concepts a little bit more. So, you know, um, while Paul was probably, uh, you know, giving a very, very concise um, introduction to Klages, which I hope uh, you guys talked about, um, it's going to, it's gonna, I think it's going to connect very well. So, yeah. okay, you thanks. know. Thanks, David.